Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. One of the big, you know, issues in the last little while has been GameStop and uh, and and what's going on with the stock market as retail investors have fought back against hedge funds and seemingly have won. And uh, one of the guys that I'm uh, friendly with on social media, Daryl Woke, a political activist and a, and a really great guy, um, has during COVID-19 become a an investor, a, a, a trader, and uh, stuck us home like uh, stuck at home like the rest of us. He's uh, got into trading, and so he's really well versed on this issue, and he's been commenting on it. And so I thought we'd uh, get him on and find out what's going on. So Daryl Wilk, how are you? Welcome to our show. What's going on with GameStop? Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, and you're allowing me to live the the dream. I've always wanted to be a CNBC and a Bloomberg commentator uh, these days. I watch them every day. But uh, yeah, what basically happened uh, to me was uh, like everybody else in March, uh, we saw the stock market uh, take a major nosedive, and uh, everybody was working at home. And I think uh, one of the benefits of working at home is you're not paying uh, for the go train anymore. You're saving money, not buying your lunch, not tapping for coffees or glasses of wine here and there. So uh, naturally with uh, extra money, then I think a lot of people have uh, turned to the, the stock market. And I actually think that was one of the main reasons for the, the recovery in, in 2020. And uh, certainly I don't wanna give anybody uh, financial advice. I can't say what's worked for me is gonna work uh, for everybody. It depends on your own situation, but uh, it's been really a, a wild ride. I think GameStop today, uh, the momentum was lost, uh, you know, or uh, finished off. It lost half of its uh, value. Uh, but ultimately, uh, what we saw was, you know, partially the, you know, going after the hedge funds that were shorting the stock 140%, which is not possible. But I think what was really going on is on social media, TikTok, Reddit, uh, there's a series of stocks that uh, young millennials have been uh, selecting and investing in, and some of it using their stimulus check in the United States, others like me just sitting at home, taking advantage of the technology like uh, Robinhood. You know, certainly we saw it last year with Tesla, Blink, Plug, Square, uh, Zoom Media. These stocks uh, all went through the roof, and, you know, this week they decided to all rally behind uh, GameStop, uh, BlackBerry, which was a benefit to me. I, you know, still hold on to the old BlackBerry, and uh, <laughs> you got one of the only people. And so I suddenly saw it shoot up 300%, but uh, I think, uh, obviously, it wasn't uh, consistent with the fundamentals, uh, you know, the story online is that a lot of these uh, kids were upset with the 2008 recession. They watched their parents lose their house. They saw the top 1% thrive. If you remember the Occupy Wall Street and all that. So apparently this was a chance to stick it to the suits. Uh, but I think what was really just going on is they've learned how to use the social media technology. They pick their stocks, they get in, they get out, uh, and they make a, a quick buck. You know, they say 10% is a good return uh, for the year in the stock market. Uh, so so pumping a stock is actually uh, illegal or inappropriate. Weren't these Reddit guys just pumping up a stock? Well, to a degree, and I mean, I'm, I'm embarrassed. You know, sometimes I'm taking advice from like an 18-year-old girl and, on TikTok and uh, her stock picks. And, you know, I... How's it different, I guess, than uh, CNBC, where you get, uh, you know, a bunch of commentators that come on and they'll tell you how great Tesla is or how great Apple is. And, if, you know, leading up to September before the stock split, those stocks were going well beyond fundamentals. And you had people talking them up every single day. You know, certainly, uh, you know, there's security regulations and there's investigations that are going on. You know, I don't know how you uh, go after baseball fan 32 uh, on Reddit, uh, but uh, essentially, you know, it's clearly a pump and a dump. And I, I think, unfortunately, the people who were left holding the bag today lost a lot of money and certainly. Yeah, so those last people that, uh, you know, bought the stock near the top and they, if the stock's down 50%, have lost it all. Yeah, no, and some people would have watched 400% uh, gains on paper. I think the, the ringleaders or some of the early uh, adapters were probably long out of it. Uh, I sold half my shares in uh, BlackBerry on Wednesday. I, I think what Robinhood did was, was absolutely terrible. Uh, obviously, they had some uh, leverage issues as well. And when they restricted which stocks you can buy uh, I, and you know put those type of restrictions, I think that led to a, a downturn that could have cost a lot. So of they've, they've talked about being the democratization of the stock market and allowing all the little guys to get involved. Is that what's happened? 
Yeah, well, I think I, I personally use uh, Royal Bank Direct Investing, and I know we have wealth uh, simple in Canada, but there's a model in, in Robinhood, Webull, where essentially there's no commissions. So that basically does encourage day trading. You don't have to worry about a, a fee every time you make a trade. You could you know buy a stock at 10 in the morning and sell it at, at 3 in the afternoon. I, and, you know, they certainly brought in a, a large crowd of, of young people that, that took to investing, which I think, you know, on balance is a good thing. Uh, but clearly, people were taking risky bets. They were, you know, listening to uh, not necessarily financially qualified people on, on social media. And, you know, if you took it the right way and you got in at the right time, then, then ultimately you, you made returns far exceeding what a professional would make. And, you know, they've compared hedge fund managers and professional investors and what their returns were in 2020 compared to the Robinhood crowd. But I think the, the hedge fund Melbourne that was involved with shorting the stock, uh, they lost 53% of their assets on uh, going short on this particular stock. Uh, and that was in the, the billions of dollars. Uh, Robinhood had to go to their uh, uh, investors and get a few extra billion dollars to keep the whole thing afloat. And I think what people don't realize is by not doing the commissions with Robinhood, what they're doing is they're monitoring what stocks are popular and they're making money just by basically that data. I, you know, I, I made some, some decent money over the summer following a site called uh, Robin Tracker, where you just figure out which stocks are most popular among the Robinhood crowd and you invest in them and, you know, they go up and up and up and then try and get out as fast as you can because uh, otherwise you'll Gosh, you know, Daryl, I went to Harvard Business School and uh, in finance, we learned uh, the efficient markets theory and, and that the markets were rational and all the information that is important is already in the market. And so therefore you can never make money. What up? Like everything you've done, everything we've seen in the last couple of weeks proves that theory is wrong. Well, I, mean, I think part of this is, you know, you look at what's happening with central banks, they're going against every economic theory that I was taught. I, I've never heard of, you know, negative real rates, uh, quantitative easing, adding 15% to the money supply, handing people $2,000 checks, rather they're working or not. Uh, so, I mean, you know, the video that, that I found most interesting in the last three weeks was, uh, again, a young girl on TikTok. Uh, how to turn your stimulus check of six hundred dollars into thirteen grand? She lists off like six uh, stocks. I I threw a couple bucks at uh, FCEL and uh, BLK just to see what would happen, and you know I didn't make thirteen grand, but certainly I uh, saw a decent return before I I sold out. Oh my god! I can't believe uh, that you're getting stock advice on TikTok from a young. Anyway, we're chatting well, today with Daryl Wolf, a buddy of mine, on uh, what's going on in the stock market today. We're going to take a break for a message and come back more, and we're going to go through this in a little bit more uh, slower detail uh, to understand exactly what happened. Stick with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crabby Radio Hour. We're talking tonight about the stock market uh, and, uh, and primarily a game stop. Um, Daryl Wolk is a buddy of mine who, uh, who's a political activist, uh, uh, is very involved in government relations and, uh, and other activities, uh, ran for, what was it, deputy mayor in Newmarket or something like that? Yeah, deputy mayor and uh, council didn't find myself uh, elected, but really enjoyed the, the experience. And like you, just uh, love politics, uh, work in government relations uh, during the day and, and social services. And uh, But found yourself with some time on your hands during COVID-19 and decided to get involved in the stock market. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, I have to say it's a hobby. I don't want to pretend I'm the, the Kathy Wood or the Warren Buffett uh, that everybody should take advice from. But uh, I have... But you're uh, emblematic of, of what's happened in the stock market, where a whole bunch of people have gotten involved uh, from a retail standpoint. So let's go through this uh, slowly, this story. So first of all, you said that there were a couple of hedge funds that shorted GameStop. So GameStop is a company that uh, sells... Uh, video games retail, which is not necessarily a great business anymore. Most people are downloading their games, uh, their video games online. Um, but uh, even though they didn't have the greatest uh, returns, uh, these hedge funds decided that uh, the stock was overvalued and uh, and sold it short. How do you sell a company short? Uh, well, basically, you can, and I. It's more of a hedge professional uh, type of move. Uh, I understand that you borrow shares at a certain price. Uh, you hope that they go down, uh, you know, and then you're able to return those shares. And again, it's something that the pension funds do. I think, you know, a lot of. I don't, I don't want to pretend I'm an expert in, in this particular area, but I do. What, know what's that, ha What's happening is these hedge funds will, as you say, they'll go uh, to major. Uh, um, banks, pension funds, et cetera, that have got a whole bunch of stock for uh, you know, other people's portfolios, borrow that stock and sell it. So they're selling something they don't own. And so therefore, 
uh, they'll make money if the stock goes down and uh, they can buy back the stock to, to, uh, to, to give it back to the person they borrowed it from at a lower price. But the interesting thing about selling short is unlike buying a stock or going what's called long on a stock, your losses can be infinite. And can you explain to the reason, us to the reason why stock losses can be infinite? Well, if, if they keep going up, then essentially your, your leverage continues to go up. And I think that's what happened to, to Melvern was essentially everybody rallied behind the stock. They all started buying it. It went up and up. And as it went up, then essentially they were forced to buy the, shot, the, stock, to cut their, or the stock to cut their losses. So I know this is an important concept. You know, if you buy a stock at 100 bucks, the most you can lose is 100 bucks. But if you sell a stock short at a hundred bucks and it goes to a thousand or 2000 or a million, you can lose an infinite amount of money. And that's why selling short is far more risky than, than buying and going long. And yeah. that's, as you said, what happened to the, uh, to the, to the hedge funds. But it's interesting. You said, and this is interesting that, that over a hundred percent of the stock was sold short. Yeah, 100, 140%. And, and it wasn't just, uh, you know, ultimately uh, the stock in, in question with GameStop. Uh, there was Blockbuster Video, which I didn't know that uh, still exists as being traded. There was AMC, the, you know, theater company, uh, BlackBerry. Uh, and they all had a theme of basically being stocks that were uh, massacred through COVID or basically technology had passed them by and, and they didn't have bright prospects. And I know, uh, you know, I, I don't think it was necessarily either just these Reddit kids that were involved in this. Uh, Elon Musk, for example, absolutely hates the, the short sellers. And, you know, he did make oh, a good point. I hate short <laughs> sellers too. So I kind of like what ended up happening, no question. But it's interesting when you go over 100% short, understand what's happening is an institution, a hedge fund has borrowed that stock, has sold it, but then actually goes out and lends it to someone else. And so therefore, when you think about that, you know, it's, it's unbelievably risky because two different firms, two different hedge funds effectively are short a stock and it's the same stock they're short. So yeah. you know, you've, you've lent something to someone that you don't even own. Yeah, no, and, and that's where, where Elon Musk's complaint is, is that you can't uh, sell a house that you don't own. You can't sell a car that you don't own, but you can sell stocks that, that you don't own. And, you know, it is a gamble. It's not based on necessarily market fundamentals. Uh, you know, the way I'm used to shorting, if you choose to do that, is you can, you know, short the NASDAQ by doing a reverse ETF on, the you know, the QQQ. Uh, and ultimately, you, you could lose 100% if you keep uh, holding it for three or four days and it continues to go up, but it, it's not an infinite losses. I, and, you know, these, these kids that are just being dismissed as, oh, they're, they're ignoring the fundamentals, they're investing in a company like GameStop, the fundamentals are they, on. Uh, they made not the right bet for a while and made a ton of money. So let's, yeah. let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, explain these no-fee um, uh, websites. So Robinhood is a, uh, an entity that uh, started the ability to uh, trade stocks, buy and sell stocks for no fee. And it's interesting because they've done that because, as you say, what they do is they actually sell the data, um, they sell the information about who's buying and selling to hedge funds. And the major investors in Robinhood are hedge funds. And so it's almost as if they created this opportunity that, you know, ate their own. Um, what do you think about having these uh, brokerage firms that cause that, that charge no fees? I think this is part of the, ironically, the same technology we're talking about, COVID technology. And the reason I got started was, uh, you know, beginning of 2020, uh, one of the, my favorite things to do over the Christmas holidays is read The Economist uh, year ahead in 2021, 2020 at the time. And uh, I started to feel that the economy was heading towards a, a downturn. And, you know, I'm lucky I have an OMERS pension, but also RRSPs that are uh, professionally managed. And I'm looking at it. My gut feeling is I think the market's going to take a dip, but I hadn't talked to my financial advisor in, in probably three years. I had no idea what was inside my, my fund. Now, of course, I'm completely responsible for that. But at the end of the day, when, when Robinhood started coming, I spent about six months watching YouTube videos and you know learning different advice. And I kept seeing at the end of it that they would offer four free shares if you signed up for Robinhood and put in $1,000 into the account. And then you're just basically able to buy and sell at any time. There's no $5 fee with Royal Bank. I pay uh, $6.95 every time I make a trade. Uh, so obviously, if you're you know making trades within thousands of dollars, that six bucks doesn't hold an effect. But if it's a hundred bucks, you're you're down six percent right away. 
uh, so that prevents you to some degree from making three or four trades immediately. But with Robinhood, it's like uh, Facebook. Uh, you sign up, you're a user, you're you know using it to your own advantage, but they own all the data. And they're not making a profit off you being on the platform. In the case of Facebook, they're making money uh, selling advertisements to you. And in this particular case, they're selling information to uh, uh, the hedge funds or, or people who, who are looking to profit uh, on a larger scale on Wall Street. Uh, but as far as the, the platform itself, I, I think this is going to kind of change and put financial advisors in jeopardy. I think a lot of people like me are looking at it and saying, you know what, I could probably do this. I watched a little bit of CNBC. I've watched a few guys on YouTube. Uh, you know, I, I know I that. I listen uh, to Baseball 28 on, uh, on TikTok. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's uh, part of it. I just got obsessed with it. Like, I'll wake up at four in the morning to see what's happening in European markets. Uh, you know, I, I replace CNN and Fox News with uh, CNBC and, and Bloomberg. I go out of my way on Twitter now to follow different people that I, that I think uh, know where the trends are going to be. You know, I try and learn about things like bonds. Uh, and, you know, a big part of the stock market uh, is like the housing market. Uh, we can't necessarily figure out why it's surging. There's you know, always a fear I'm going to wake up one day and it's going to be down significantly like it was in uh, March of 2020, February. Uh, but ultimately, I, I think these platforms are great in the sense that they're getting. Okay, but let's, okay let's, let's talk about some of these platforms. So what you're saying is that, you know, stock market information that used to come primarily either from your financial advisor or from the stock, you know, the stock uh, charts on, on in your newspaper um, and maybe from CNBC and things like that. Are now all of a sudden taking off on Twitter, on uh, on different platforms like Reddit and TikTok. Yeah, and, and these Facebook are primarily and millennials and uh, and other you know retail investors that are all of a sudden putting in short little bursts their their ideas, their uh, their bets on what's going on in the stock market, and they get a huge following. Yeah, and, and people are, are just interested. I mean, if you go onto YouTube, there's, you know, I, I'm on it as much as I watch regular television. And ultimately, you know, there's guys who will talk about the end of the world and how we should all buy gold and Bitcoin. Uh, there's people who will go through the, the charts and get into pattern trading. Uh, there's young people that, you know, just recommend, oh, buy Blink uh, gas stations for electric cars. I, and then there, you know, there's there's people that you know show you how to day trade and and make returns uh, in that fashion. I, I still think there's a you know for me personally an investment component of it. I'd say 75% are, are traditional investments and 25% to sort of rolling the dice. Uh, one theory for the past year was with sports shut down, uh, you couldn't really go on DraftKings and place a bet. So why not place a bet on stocks? So I know Dave Portney and Barstool was in on this, uh, you know, all through the summer and the fall and telling everybody to bet on Carnival Cruise and the airlines and those stocks would go up 30% for, for no apparent reason. So I, I think what we are seeing generally is there are influencers. Uh, there's people who've taken an interest in this for, for whatever reason. Maybe it's because they have extra time on their hands. Maybe it's because sports betting wasn't available. Maybe they're getting a stimulus check and there's nowhere else to put your money. Like, you know, if you invest in a bond, you're guaranteed to lose money. Uh, if you put it in the bank account, then, you know, potentially with the central banks and all the policies that are happening with money printing, you'll probably lose it through inflation. So basically, you might as well roll the dice and throw it in the stock market. And you can take the traditional bets like, you know, oil companies, banks, uh, uh, you know, safe returns where, you know, telecoms where you might get, you know, 10% a year, which would be good by traditional standards. Or you can invest in things like penny stocks or what you think the future is going to be. And, you know, for people that, that love following the world economy or, you know, politics or what's going on uh, around us. I, I find it interesting. You got a U.S. election, for example. One of my uh, best returns is Green Thumb Technologies. You know, I figure, okay, Democrats are probably going to win. Joe Biden will legalize marijuana. Where, how can I make a buck on this? And sure enough, those stocks are all up 30, 40 uh, percent. So you know, there's no legislation in the Senate, but it's a gamble. Daryl, uh, 1999, uh, you were probably just a kid at the time. Um, I was uh, in a presentation by the chief economist of Royal Bank. Um, and he uh, was describing how he was in a taxi in Tokyo and the taxi driver was describing what stocks he should be buying um, and was using his visa card to buy stocks and tech stocks. And he says, um, uh, in a big meeting I was in, whenever the taxi driver on his visa is uh, buying stocks and telling me what stocks to buy, I know there's a crash coming because it's too frothy. And two, three months later was uh, the tech crash of, uh, of 2000. And, uh, and, and I remember that forever. 
with what's going on in the market today, we're at you know almost an all-time high. We've got retail market millennials, what you call her, baseball girl, twenty-eight. Um, you know, providing investment advice, a whole bunch of people doing crazy things that make no sense for BlackBerry and for GameStop. Are we at a frothy top? I I, I think we are in a bubble, and and ultimately, you know, maybe I'm arrogant to think that I'll be able to sell or get out just before it, it falls. I mean, I've predicted for a long time. I think the housing market's going to crash at some point this year. I think uh, the stock market, we're going to see a repeat of, of the March lows eventually. I, I think everything in the economy right now is completely fake. Uh, you know, it's it's all propped up by the Fed and, and central banks and what the Bank of Canada is doing. And, you know, clearly there's a disconnect between what's happening on, on Wall Street and Bay Street with the real economy where small businesses are just being decimated. A lot of people have lost their job. Uh, people are taking on more, more debt than ever uh, as a result of the low interest rates. And I mean, I, as I said, every day I wake up, I'm checking out the Asian, the European markets. I'm expecting a limit down. Uh, for some reason, it's more likely to be limit up and it just keeps going up and up and up. And, you know, I think everybody thinks so. I've, I've got some advantage over uh, other people. Uh, maybe but are, I know you the, are you that last investor in GameStop that's uh, going to be 50% well, down? Well, and I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm jumping and chasing all, all of this uh, stuff. Like the truth is, if you see a stock that's up, you know, 300% and then you buy it at that point, you've probably already missed the gains. Uh, and that's why I say I wouldn't necessarily recommend people take my specific talk, uh, stock tips, like, you know, using the marijuana example with the U.S. election. It was a good bet in October. Uh, now you're, you're probably just jumping on. You're going to miss the gains. It's, it's gone as high as it can go, in my opinion. And if anything, it's going to go down when people realize the process of it going through the Senate and, and the fundamentals catch up. Uh, so, so I think, you know, you've, you, you've got to, first of all, gamble if you're going to play the gambling game with what you can afford, just like you're going to a casino. And then if you're legitimately investing and trying to save for your future, you know, that's where the fundamentals come into play. And you should be looking for low PEs. You should be looking at dividends. Uh, you should be looking at companies that you know are going to be around 10, 20 years from now and investing uh, for the long term. But, you know, I, I think uh, with GameStop, I don't think that these kids were stupid. I think there were some people who might have jumped on way too late and they are the greater fool. And, you know, maybe if you buy a house right now, you're the greater fool. If you buy a Tesla right now, you might be the greater fool. Uh, or, you know, you could be wrong. I sold off my shares of Tesla in uh, September after the stock split when everybody was saying it was a bubble. You know, the biggest regret I have about that is I probably missed another 60% uh, in growth. We're talking with Daryl Wolk tonight about uh, the current stock market situation, what's happening with GameStop and hedge funds and Robinhood and, uh, and retail investors, and are we at a frothy top? We're going to take a break and come back more with Daryl in just a minute. Stay with us. We're back on the Brian Crombie Radio Hour in Second and 60. We're chatting with Daryl Wolk tonight about what's going on in the stock market, which just seems like a roller coaster. It's unbelievable. It's been fun to watch. Um, and uh, I got to tell you, Daryl, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in my, uh, my, my home office and my son comes running down the stairs last week going, Dad, do you know what's going on with GameStop? It's like unbelievable. We're taking over. The, 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 the kids are, are beating the uh, professional hedge fund guys. And beating them big, like we had a couple of hedge funds that lost billions of dollars. Yeah, it's incredible. No, the power of the retail investors when they all got together and bought a stock to combat the uh, the shorts was was really quite impressive. Oh no, it was super exciting. I was you know watching the the Twitter accounts, uh, including the Wall Street bets one, and every revolution starts when a suit pisses off the common man, and uh, they were all high on themselves. And every uh, revolution starts when a suit pisses off the common man. That's yeah, a great quote. The type, of, type of things that they were tweeting, and you know they they wanted to get into silver, so ultimately they have all the cartoons and Braveheart videos of them capturing the silver. So I mean, I, you know, for for the people who got into it, it was a, a great day. I think uh, a lot of people are upset with the one percent, and I think the real uh, issue comes down to income inequality. I think uh, we're seeing you know a lot of people make a, a lot of money during this time, particularly the the billionaires. I think I, I read based on what Elon Musk, Zuckerberg, uh, Bezos uh, have made just during the pandemic, they could afford to hand a stimulus check of three thousand dollars for every single American. I, so I mean, from that perspective, it's good to see uh, the little guy win. But I suspect what happened was you know a lot of people organized on Reddit. 
but they weren't alone. Uh, others uh, who were billionaires saw what was happening, got in, got out. They made a, a good profit as well. And then I think there were a few hedge funds that lost. And, and even though they say they're fighting uh, against, uh, you know, big Wall Street, a lot of people uh, may have their pensions impacted if those uh, hedge funds were investing on their behalf. So what do you think about this? You know, the, 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 and we mm -hmm. talked about this already a little bit, but the regular economy is devastated. We're going to have, uh, you know, we, we had maybe a depression, at least a recession uh, this uh, past year. Uh, growth uh, this year is going to be, most people think, in the 3% range. So not near coming back and, uh, and, uh, and adapting for what uh, happened in this past year. We've got unbelievable unemployment. We've got huge amounts of bankruptcies. I'm really worried that uh, the... Uh, the full impact of the bankruptcies and more importantly, the impact of leverage. Cause I just talk and you probably do too, to so many small businesses that have taken on huge amounts of debt so they can stay alive and, and so they can pay their employees or so they can pay their, even the reduced rent. And, uh, and so you're going to have these companies, they're going to be the walking dead. They're going to be, they're going to reopen when the economy reopens, but um, they're um, they're They've got this debt millstone around their neck that, that is going to, is going to strangle them. Um, so we've got, you know, unemployment, bankruptcies, um, you know, huge amount of uh, consumer lack of confidence, and yet the stock market's at this almost all-time high. Why is there this incredible disc? And as you say, this all-time high stock market seems to have benefited very few people, and it's the one percent of the one percent. What? Why do we have this incredible disequilibrium? This discontinuity. Yeah, no, my, my theory is a lot of it goes back to the financial crisis of 2008. We saw the, the same type of policies around the quantitative easing and the, the zero interest rates. And I believe what happened was the, the wealthy got wealthier and ultimately the middle class got trapped in, in more and more debt. I, 2020, you know, they, they said it was a recession, a, a possible depression. I, I actually think uh, two or three years from now, we're going to say that that was a good year. Uh, governments went to incredible lengths uh, to prop things up. Everybody got their curb check. People were able to pay down debt. Uh, ultimately, in some cases, uh, income went up uh, because a lot of the jobs, unfortunately, that were lost were some of the lower income jobs. And a lot of the people who didn't lose their jobs were people who you know, were doing fairly well, able to work from home, save on some expenses. If you did own any stocks in the market, if you owned a house, chances are your, your wealth went up uh, because both basically are in a bubble. Uh, but as you mentioned, leverage is completely out of control, and it's largely because of negative real interest rates. And if the bond market decides to change things and ultimately interest rates go up for any reasons, government's going to be uh, in big trouble. A lot of businesses, particularly the small businesses, I read uh, the average small business rate now has had to take on $100,000 in debt just to, to stay afloat. Uh, and then individuals, you look at where the housing market is, it isn't because people are suddenly making huge amounts of money. It's because they're borrowing huge amounts of uh, uh, debt. So ultimately, you know, if right now uh, interest rates are 0 0.025, at least set by the Bank of Canada, if that was to double and, and ultimately translate when mortgage renewals come up, we're going to see a lot of, you know, foreclosures. We're going to see a lot of evictions. We're going to see a lot of landlords go under. We're going to see probably half the businesses go under. And th this can't last forever. And I think right now the you know, the market's enjoying the good times. Maybe it's like the roaring 20s. Uh, but ultimately, this is all going to catch up with us. And I think uh, we're not out of the woods yet by any stretch. I saw in, in your video analyzing 2020 that you think we're in for another six months of this. I think it's going to be deep into 2022 before we go back to any kind of normal. And I just wonder how much we can keep the, you know, smoke and mirrors going. Well, I think that, the, you know, the six month, I, I just uh, spoke with a gentleman uh, today about uh, these new uh, variants uh, of, uh, of the virus. And, uh, and he says, Brian, your six months is right if uh, we can close down and not allow the variants to go crazy. But if we get these uh, mutations uh, that go crazy, um, effectively, you're right that it's gonna be an, another year uh, because we're gonna need to uh, uh, dramatically uh, close down the economy. We're gonna have to develop new vaccines. Um, and, uh, and, and he's worried that, uh, these, uh, the South African variant he's saying is twice as infectious and maybe twice, uh, as, uh, high a mortality rate. So I think you're right in that regard is that, uh, you know, my more optimistic, uh, by the summertime we're out of it, uh, is only right if people really protect themselves over the course of the next little while. So these new mutations, these new variants uh, don't, uh, don't have an opportunity to, uh, to explode across the country. Um, but you're worried about interest rates going up. 
with, uh, with no inflation in the marketplace, with so many people unemployed, with so many bankruptcies, um, why would we have inflation such that interest rates would be pushed up? Well, you can, you can see right now, treasury bonds are, are worth nothing. And I know pension funds have to invest in them essentially based on their own and internal policies, but they're not making any return right now. And with bonds where they are, this is one of the reasons why the stock market's been on fire because people can't just, you know, my first investment was my grandmother bought me a Canada savings bond. You know, if uh, you did that now for five years at current rates, you're, you're going to lose money for sure. So now what's happened is people are forced to go into riskier investments. Uh, the Bank of Canada now owns 37% of all debt in Canada. I, we're not the world's reserve currency. I, I think the U.S. is also in trouble. You know, we're more or less implementing Venezuela, Zimbabwe-style policies, but because everybody's hold doing it. Hold it, hold it, hold it. We're, we're, we're importing and executing Zimbabwe's policies? Well, we're ultimately printing money unlimited. The only reason is when Zimbabwe did it, then uh, they had to go to the grocery store, you know, taking wheelbarrows of cash, their dollar fell in, in value. Our dollar's falling against the price of gold, against the price of Bitcoin. You can see the inflation already when you go to the grocery stores, look at the housing market, look at the rental market, except for Toronto where there's less demand. Uh, but right now the Europeans are doing this, the Americans are doing this, the Japanese have been doing this for years. So relative to other currencies, we're not seeing it. Uh, but how do we get out of this? You know, you mentioned uh, the leverage at the end of the day. We've got a, you know, a fifty billion dollar provincial debt uh, deficit. Uh, you know, at least five hundred billion federally, probably another five hundred billion in uh, quantitative easing. There's no way we're going to pay for that with uh, austerity or with uh, tax uh, hikes uh, of any kind. Uh, I think they're going to devalue the currency massively, make our debts look small, and I think, unfortunately, the people who are going to be at the losing end of this are. Those uh, who are on fixed income pensions, social assistance, who are, you know, savers with money in a bank account. Uh, you can already see the, the purchasing power of the currency has gone down dramatically. And I don't see any reason why that's going to change long term. So if you were uh, in government, what would you do? Well, at, the, at this point, uh, ultimately, you have no choice but to continue to, to support people for, for as long as it takes. You can't just cut things off. But I think in, in 2008 uh, and, and now, the difference between how we've managed a, a recession or a correction uh, is we've tried to make sure that nobody feels uh, any pain. And we've done that with uh, extreme policies. I, in the 80s, when this happened, the tech bubble that you talked about, people just let the correction happen. And a, a correction can be good if it corrects things back to, to fundamentals. But we've moved away from the fact that you know, you can feel any monetary pain. We don't want to see the bankruptcies. We don't want to see the business closures. We don't want to see increased poverty. Uh, so right now we're, we're trying our best to, to paper over it. I, in terms of what the solution is, I, you know, I think everybody's looking for one. Uh, a lot of the damage is already done, to be honest with you. I, and, you know, I, we saw inflation, I guess, through the 70s. I will probably see something similar again when, once the, the party comes to an end. So should retail investors uh, exit the market or should they uh, start investing even more? I think you almost have to invest more. I mean, at the end of the day, I, you know, I, I try and keep the portfolio at 75% safe. I like precious metals. I like uh, timber companies. I like things that I believe the, the price is going to go up through inflation. And if I see some craziness happening, rather it be with uh, Tesla or Apple or Square or Blink uh, or BlackBerry by accident, uh, then I'll try and take advantage of it. Uh, but you have to know that, you know, at some point, uh, if I was to, to buy a home, I, I could be the guy walking in and, you know, maybe there will be a, a series of defaults six months from now that uh, leads to the housing market to crash and, and maybe you end up paying twice uh, what it's worth. Uh, that can happen with the stock market as well. So it's be careful, be cautious, but to be honest, you should keep investing and, and do it incrementally. Uh, don't try and time the market. Uh, if you have extra money and you're fortunate enough to have extra money, don't just throw it into the bank account. Uh, try and do something to make it grow. Uh, and there's lots of options that, that you may have, but but it's a risky time for everybody out there. And, uh, you know, you saw what happened in March. I luckily started after that. But, you know, while you see the NASDAQ up 66% since uh, March lows, there was a lot of people that didn't start investing in March. They started investing long before that. And, you know, I bet you some panic sold in April when, when things hit an all-time low. I never got back in. Um, yeah. The SEC is looking what happened uh uh, last week with GameStop and the, and the and the hedge funds, what do you think they should do? 
if anything? I think it's going to be tough for them to uh, laugh at this. I mean, normally they're they're looking for insider trading. They're looking for you know misinformation that might be communicated from inside a company uh, to the general public. I, I I think that the challenge here is you know what are they going to do? Go and surf Twitter and you know try and find the real identities behind fake accounts with cartoon characters as their profile picture. Uh, are they going to tell people you know? If I go on my Twitter and I say, I think Shopify is the greatest company of all time, it's going to go to the moon and uh, pass Amazon. Uh, are they going to come after me because I've got, you know, a few thousand followers? Uh, so I, I don't think there's a whole lot that they can do. I think the, the best thing that, you know, people can do is educate themselves, try and learn as much as you can. Don't just jump into something like anything that you, you don't know what you're doing. You haven't taken the time to learn. Try and study for a little while. You know, with Royal Bank Direct Investing, they offer you a practice account. I spent uh, 90 days just, you know, buying and trading stocks that weren't worth any money just to practice and see what would happen. Uh, I would recommend everybody go in with that type of attitude before they're using real money. For these um, investors in uh, in GameStop to win, what they needed to do is they needed to uh, to get a whole bunch of people to buy such that you would overcome the pressure from the shorts, get the stock uh, price to go up. But as we've talked about, they need to sell eventually because – they don't want to be the last people holding the bag of this stock that is now dramatically overvalued. And as you say, has just come down by 50%. Um, if you were an equity analyst and you wrote a report um, recommending a buy and you sold, um, you'd be guilty of something um, bad. Uh, so you can't recommend, if you're an equity analyst, you can't recommend something and then take an opposite action. But these, uh, these Reddit sites these Twitter sites, these TikTok sites, at some point in time must have been doing that. They must have been saying buy at the same time as they were unloading their positions. Isn't there yeah, something I, that people should do to stop that? Well, and, and there's there's one guy who, who's got ties, who's seen as sort of the, the ringleader. He may face uh, some problems. I did hear of, you know, during the tech bubble, 14-year-old uh, kids uh, getting a visit from the SEC. I, so, so, I mean, certainly if, if there is anything illegal happening, uh, it, it'll be dealt with. But I, I think it's hard if you go onto a group Facebook, uh, you know, new market financial advice, uh, and everybody's just giving their opinions. Uh, you know, I, I don't see how that's much different than, you know, every time I watch CNBC and there's a guy talking up Bitcoin, there's a guy talking up Tesla. Like, like look at Tesla. It's, uh, you know, it's not GameStop in terms of its future. But it's now worth uh, more than every single auto company, and they sell four hundred thousand cars, most of it with government subsidies. Uh, so how can that be worth what it is? And it continues to go up and up. And you know, I've seen a parade of people show up on television talking about how this is the future, electric cars. No, it's not in a bubble. I, you know, I, if you choose to take that advice, you, you've got to have some personal responsibility. I, you know, where I think it would become a bit different would be if Elon Musk tweeted something that was totally misleading with regards to the financials or with their future product uh, line or something that people legitimately acted on and it turned out to be false information from a company insider. We've been chatting with Daryl Wolk tonight about what happened last week uh, with GameStop and uh, and the economy, uh, uh, the stock market, not the economy, and, uh, and, and the fight against hedge funds. We're going to take a break and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. We're chatting tonight with Daryl Wolk about what happened last week with GameStop. Um, GameStop, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is a, uh, a retail company in the United States that sells, retails uh, in bricks and mortar um, video games, which uh, obviously uh, a lot are being sold over, their, over the internet today. And uh, GameStop was down in uh, their financial performance as well as the stock market performance. But a bunch of websites um, said... Uh, uh, a bunch of uh, hedge funds thought it would go down even further and sold the company short. Uh, and it's interesting uh, what Daryl has described is how a bunch of retail investors, typically uh, it's been described as uh, millennial investors that got together on Reddit and TikTok and Facebook groups and YouTube groups and other things like that all ganged up together to, uh, to go after, as Daryl described it, the suits and, uh, and destroy them. And they did. And they did it by, by buying GameStop, having the stock price go up, uh, creating uh, a classic short squeeze for the hedge funds, which faced billions of dollars of losses and had to cover their positions. Um, and uh, that created more upward momentum as they bought the stock to, uh, to cover their short positions. Um, and, uh, and the stock skyrocketed. But 
The stock then came down a little bit, fifty uh, percent, but it still got probably more to go um, to uh, to come back more to its uh, fundamentals. And so the problem is, is that in the end, those last people, those last retail investors that jumped on the bandwagon, ended up probably losing some money. And the first people that uh, got the idea to go after the shorts and buy the stock probably made good money. And so, like a lot of things, it's good when you get in early, but it's not great if you're some of the last people in. You got to be careful about being those last people in. What do we learn from all this? Let me give you a couple of my own personal views if I could, and then Daryl, jump in. Um, the, the one learning that I have is, um, is I do think that hedge funds and shorts have had too much influence and power um, in, the, uh, in the past. Um, and you know we've heard, and there's been lots of books uh, written about it, about how some of the hedge funds get together. Uh, we used to get together for breakfast in uh, New York, or used to get together and probably getting together now online and talking about how they're gonna gang up and short some company and create a problem such that the company is under attack. And uh, this has frankly happened to me in my own, uh, my own professional career. Uh, and there's very little that you can do to combat that uh, as a company. And, uh, and I do think that, that these shorts needed to be disciplined. And uh, by losing a couple billion dollars, they have been disciplined. And I think it's fantastic that some people have gotten together to try to find a way to combat the shorts. And I do feel that uh, the shorts need more regulation, more oversight. Um, I think that uh, you know, if, if, if you're a corporate insider and you know that something's gonna happen and you buy the stock, you're guilty of insider trading. That's clear. But if you're a hedge fund and you know that a whole bunch of other people are, sh are gonna short and you short, How's that not insider trading? I don't know. Uh, and so I've really wondered about how the shorts could get together and as a, as a group uh, attack a uh, company. And so I think it's fantastic that uh, what happened last week uh, happened and, and they got disciplined. But the retail investors that came in in the end lost money. And so I think this comes to my, my second lesson. And that is that I do think that we're at a frothy top. Um, I worry about that. Uh, and I worry that what happens at a frothy top is that um, the last people in lose money. And so be very careful about what you buy. I'm not suggesting you need to sell right away. Uh, I do think uh, um, if you've made a lot of money, selling some stock positions might be prudent. Um, but at the same time, you know, frothy tops can continue for a long period of time. Um, but I do think uh, this advice that I got at one point in time about uh, 20 years ago uh, is that when a whole bunch of retail investors come in and start buying on margin and buying with their Visa cards and stuff like that, um, that you got to be wary. Things have changed a little bit, which is lesson number three, in that I do think that these no fee websites, brokerage uh, funds, um, um, have changed things a little bit. And when they talk about democratizing uh, stock investing, to a certain extent, it's true because investing in stocks has been a problem and only the big companies that can afford to buy in big chunks, big mutual funds, big institutions, et cetera, can, uh, can take the hit of the fees. And so I think uh, allowing the retail investor, the small retail investor to be competitive um, because they don't have those fees when they buy, I think is a wonderful democratization. And so things may be a little bit different this time. Which brings me to my fourth thing, and that is I do think there's this incredible discontinuity between the real economy and the stock market, and we got to be wary of that. I think the real economy is under attack. It's under a problem. It's under pressure, um, and, uh, and the stock market has been kept up, I think, only because of low interest rates um, and the low interest rates that have been fueled by uh, quantitative easing, by the central banks, by the Bank of Canada, uh, et cetera, and I worry that as Daryl has said, it can't continue forever. And, uh, and low interest rates that have fueled, I think the stock market have fueled the real estate market. Um, and I've been wrong on this for a long period of time um, because I, I worry that we are in a bubble in both. Um, but it's sometimes bubbles, balloons, grow, 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 grow. And the end is always a pop. And, uh, and you know, it's interesting. You take a look at what happened in, uh, in the 20s, 1920s after the uh, Spanish flu. Um, we did have an unbelievable economic boom. Uh, the V-shaped recovery that President, former President Donald Trump talked about really did happen. We had the Roaring Twenties. We had an unbelievable economic boom. We had the Great Gatsby. We had Flapper Girls. We had uh, speakeasies. But it ended in 1929 the way we know about it with a huge, spectacular crash. So in the end, I think there is going to be a pop. What I don't know is when. So that's what I take about all of this. Daryl, what do you think? 
Yeah, I think uh, my takeaways would be similar, but uh, speaking to the the young investors out there, the first thing I'd, I'd want to say is congratulations for getting in at your age. I'm 40 right now. I started six months ago. Granted, I had some professionals uh, doing it when I started getting into the, the work world, but if you're 21, 22, 23, and you're already thinking about your future and your retirement and investing in the stock market, I think that should be praised and we want those people in the market. Uh, second thing is similar to what you say, low interest rates is prop this up. If you're going to trade, the best way that you can make money is to actually save. That's probably what I've learned during this pandemic. Don't uh, tap your card for a coffee or for an unnecessary meal or for an unnecessary night out. If you can save $300 and invest in a Facebook stock or an Apple stock, uh, you know, that, that's really the way that you're, you're going to make your money. Don't worry about uh, it, uh, you know, going up and down in any given day. Uh, but ultimately, the number one thing I would say is don't invest on margin. Uh, if you are going to gamble, uh, just like if you are going to the casino, uh, only play with what you can afford. Uh, otherwise, you should be looking at the, the fundamentals, perhaps investing in uh, products that you believe in. You know, this week uh, I had a crazy return on BlackBerry, but it was simply because I'm a diehard for the phone. I, when I purchased it six months ago, you know, it was because I really hoped the phone would come back uh, and I love BlackBerry. Uh, as soon as I saw that it was up 300% for no apparent reason, then I sold half my shares uh, because obviously uh, that goes against common sense. Uh, so ultimately, you know, be aware of, of what's going on out there. And I, I generally have a rule, try and diversify your portfolio as much as possible, have some safe stocks, have some riskier ones. Uh, my personal rule is uh, don't put any more than 5% in any single investment and, uh, you know, make sure you take the time to do the research, follow what's happening in this type of market. It can drop at any time, as, as Brian pointed out. And uh, the last thing that you want, uh, I was, you know, I put a big investment down in gold, uh, went on vacation to Algonquin Park, uh, stopped at Weber's on the way home and realized that I had lost 13% of my portfolio in that uh, sector. So uh, if you're away from it for 10 seconds, uh, a lot can change. So, so just be aware, do the research. But, but most of all, I'm not going to jump on all these kids or criticize them like I see some of the other pundits do. Ultimately, you're ahead of the game by getting involved at your age. I wish I started in my 20s and just uh, keep doing what you're doing. Just make sure you're not doing it risky with other people's money uh, on debt uh, and you know, try and save for your future. That's a great thing. Daryl Bolt, thanks for joining us. Interesting conversation about what's going on with the stock market today. Well, that's it for the Brian Crombie Radio Hour for tonight. Thanks for joining us. Good night, everybody.